So we've been working on that since about 2008. Um, uh, we thought that we could throw together some classic game mechanics like the treasure hunt game mechanics, wrap it in a narrative. We had this brand new technology, the iPhone uh, 3GS, and we thought we could put all that together and kids would just go outdoors, hit the parks, um, and we'd have this bright new future. Um, as this slide suggests, uh, we got it massively wrong. It was a much more complicated issue than we first believed. Um, so today I'd like to discuss some of the errors uh, that we made while we were trying to create these location-based games, our first attempts. Um, I'm hoping that I've got a friendly audience because given this is Games for Change, I, I know that we're all here and trying to promote um, healthier behaviours or better behaviours in different uh, areas. And um, mistakes are inevitable. Uh, the Dr. Zeus things were great earlier. Uh, that's, it's amazing how much you lean on Dr. Zeus when you're in an area like this. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also made a lot of areas in terms of business model. I'm just going to ignore that today. It's a huge area as well. Um, I'm really going to focus on the substance uh, of what we did wrong um, and, uh, and leave that for another time. But obviously user adoption and user retention uh, is a huge commercial issue and that gets wrapped up uh, in, in game mechanics and narrative. Um, so, so I will address that um, obviously today. So it's a good time to explain why we first got into it. We, we first saw the iPhone 3GS and we thought this is a fantastic device for immersion. Um, rather than the, the screen being the locus for the game, uh, suddenly the whole world could be the locus for the game. Uh, we started with the iPhone 3GS. I know that Stefan uh, created a location-based game in 2002, well before the iPhone came along. Um, and we've all been playing like uh, location-based games since we were kids. We've all done treasure hunts or um, even scavenger hunts at the first week of university. So it's a pretty tried old um, uh, game mechanic, even though it feels new. Um, we, I, I went to a festival in, in New York called Come Out and Play, um, and they are strictly about outdoor gaming. Um, and we were playing a game in Grand Central Station where some people were spies and some people were, were enemies and you had to identify each other. And the great thing about that game is you didn't know who the other players were. So suddenly everyone in the station became actors or, or, or extras in this enormous game that you were playing. Um, and it was really fun. It was a real sense of immersion. Uh, but we wanted to do the same thing, not with a paper game, uh, but with a digital game. So the first question we had to answer was, can we get that kind of emoti emoti uh, emotional response um, using these devices? So we got a loop uh, of music and uh, we increased the tempo of that music uh, the further you got away from a GPS point. So we used uh, the loop from Jaws, you know, the famous and uh, we put the GPS point on St Kilda Beach. We wrapped our iPhones in uh, plastic bags, strapped them to our backs and started swimming into the middle of Port Phillip Bay. And we thought whoever can get the furthest wins the game, basically. It was incredible. No one could get further than about 50 metres. It was terrifying. As soon as your head went under the water and you heard that music, it, the emotional response was extreme. Uh, we all tried it a few times. I still have problems in open water. Um, it, it was really, really terrifying and we thought we're onto something here. Okay, we've got, we've got rich media, uh, we've got GPS. We're combining the two things. This is going to be easy. <sighs> like I said, we got it so wrong. It was a much more complicated issue. The first thing we did was the Hidden Park. The Hidden Park, I'll just explain it quickly, it was the first game, it was in 2009. Basically, uh, it was a series of GPS points that triggered rich media and it was for kids. So they arrived at the park and they would get a phone call, which looked like an Apple phone call. They'd answer the phone, there'd be a character there who would tell them that they needed to save the park and do various things in the park. It was very linear. You went from one point to the next point to the next point. Um, and there was really no agency for the players. It was, I think the narrative overall worked well, so I won't go into that, this is about errors. The gameplay really didn't work. Um, but we did learn an enormous amount from that. Um, so, uh, the biggest thing we learned was about user acquisition. It was about on-ramp. It was about getting people to first play it. Um, in order to do a location-based game that is location-dependent, you have to get people to go somewhere and they've never played the game before. That's an enormous upfront investment. Zynga has taught us about on-ramp. Okay, <coughs> zero upfront inve investment, and then slowly increase and increase until you've got people sitting there clicking away forever uh, and doing the most boring activities, but they're still doing it because they've been engaged and they've been engaged from the very first moment. 
So getting that on ramp right was the first thing that we had to address in location-based gaming. Um, we, so so that you, you couldn't make a location-based game that wasn't dependent on location, which is what some people have done. Shadow Cities is a great example. Shadow Cities, you can play the game anywhere. It takes place on the map. The thing is, this is games for change. We're trying to get people off the couch and outdoors and actually active. And uh, the makers of uh, Shadow Cities reported that 74% of their players uh, play their game from home or at work. So that's clearly not the answer that we were looking for. Um, it solves the on-ramp problem, but it does absolutely nothing to get gamers outdoors and leading a healthier lifestyles. At the other end of the extreme, you have Run Zombies Run. Um, run Zombies Run is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Basically, you run and zombies chase you. And the motivation is, is if you stop running, you'll be eaten by zombies. I mean, that's a kind of pretty simple um, uh, summary of it. But, but it gamifies running. It's heaps of fun to play. But the problem is, is it's really aimed at people who are already running. Uh, it's more likely that you're going to play Run Zombies Run if you're a fan of jogging, not if you're a fan of zombies. And we really need to get the zombies out um, if we're going to make a change. It's a great game though, and it does, because it's not location dependent, because the user is setting their own location, it is giving us some hints about where we need to go with location-based gaming. Um, sorry. Uh, I think the other issue about it, I've just uh, noticed in the notes, sorry about this, this is the first time I've delivered this, so I, I am relying on my notes quite a bit. But the other thing about it is, it's, it's not, uh, the other thing about a game like, um, uh, like uh, uh, Shadow Cities, is it's not really making the most out of location-based gaming. I mean, it's not just enough just to put things on a map, sprites on a map, and then have people playing uh, around the real world map. To make the most of location-based gaming, you really want to go back to the, the jaws in the water um, type of emotions uh, and the kind of things that I was, I was getting out of the games in, uh, in New York, where you really felt completely immersed in this, uh, in this world. So, let's imitate success. Foursquare. Foursquare is the obvious, the most uh, well-known location-based game. Uh, it's the big breakout hit of location-based gaming. 10 million registered users, thousands of check-ins a day. It's enormously successful. It doesn't have a lot of depth. Some people question whether it even is a game. But it is brilliant for its on-ramp. Uh, the game mechanic is just seamlessly integrated into players' lives already. So you can go to anywhere and check in, uh, and you're immediately engaging with the game. I think that's the best thing about that game and the biggest lesson you can draw from it is that it allows players to draw their own theatre of play. They can say that they want to check in at university more often, at home more often, or any 7-Eleven in between. They're defining the theatre of play. That was our biggest lesson from Foursquare. So, Foursquare offers the ultimate on-ramp model. Uh, but our, our goal, our ultimate goal, is behaviour like Run Zombies Run, really getting people active. So what we want is um, uh, so what we want is to is to is to draw this path is to thread this needle between those two things. Um, in order to do that, we need a comfortable on ramp that integrates with a player's behaviours and then gently pushes the boundaries of that behaviour to encourage change. Um, our goal is for games to create an evolving scaffolding uh, that encourages people that encourages people to get outdoors. Better than this is to imagine the game as an ecosystem that builds healthy behaviours over time. And social elements will, be a will play a vital role in that ecosystem. So as if we didn't have enough, a hard enough task integrating location-based game mechanics into our game, we need to up the ante and ask for some social features too. Uh, luckily, we can again look to Foursquare. Some people question whether it's a game. Like I said, um, Foursquare itself describes itself for a brief period as a location-aware social network, which I suspect was more for investors than anything else. But it is a good point. I mean, it's a very social game. Uh, it's a beautiful mechanic because it's, it's persistent competitive gameplay uh, that can be played independently of other players. So not only is it not dependent on the game setting, the, uh, the theatre of play, uh, but, but they can also choose who else they're competing with and at what times. So, um, this asynchronous competitive behaviour is just another example of Foursquare seamlessly integrating with players' schedules and behaviour. We'd like to take that on-ramp and that seamless integration and start to move it out a little. So we're talking about communities for change. We're talking about using social uh, to, to um, engender better behaviour. That, that is actually an entire other topic, which I'll leave to other people. Um, but I thought I'd just talk about how the social me uh, mechanics that we're familiar with, um, with Zynga titles, for instance, they do offer, like, like Farmville, they do offer an interesting way forward. 
Uh, so gifting and sharing, they're a great way for those titles to spread virally. Um, but we can also use those social mechanics to encourage others to participate. Um, and we can use them to participate in healthy activities. Weight Watchers is a classic example of community monitoring. Uh, it's an old example, obviously. But in digital, you can move beyond just monitoring and you can go to sharing successes with each other. And in gaming, that's a, that's a key mechanic, particularly in Farmville. So, I'll move on to narrative. Narrative ties our gameplay and social mechanics together. Uh, there needs to be this seamless interplay between these three elements in order for a game to feel cohesive and enjoyable to the player. And I think we've heard that this morning uh, from a real professional um, who uh, spoke about this cohesive experience, this cohesive design experience and tying together um, devices, design, uh, game mechanics and narrative. So narrative is simple to conjure, especially when we have rich media to rely on. Uh, in that first example, the narrative is very, very simple. Uh, you've got a swimmer. Uh, who's swimming on their own. Uh, in the middle, we have building fear, and at the end, we have a horrible shark attack. Now, no one wants to get to the end of that story, but it is undeniable that it is uh, an incredibly powerful narrative. So the problem here is that we have a linear narrative. Uh, and again, that is linked to this concept of linear gameplay and linear GPS points. Game narratives offer players the agency within a set of rules to create their own emergent narratives. Um, and that's the most enjoyable aspect of game players, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, to go back to the example of Foursquare, the emergent narrative might be uh, three people battling over uh, the mayor of a particular Starbucks. It's a simple emergent mechanic that people have their own agency in. Uh, and it's incredibly engaging. It can be played out over days, weeks or months. Um, I, one of the reasons why I didn't want to leave New York was because I had a mayorship there. Um, it was really something that uh, drew me in every day. Uh, and it's a fun mechanic. So, how do we use those mechanics for change? A narrative for change will, will follow the reward path um, that I referred to when discussing game mechanics. Slowly bringing people outside of their, game, uh, outside of their uh, comfort zone. So early on in the game when the mechanic defers to the daily activities of the player, the narrative is about nesting. The narrative is about creating their theatre of gaming around locations most frequently visited. So their home, their workplace, their school, it's their choice. But the narrative must encourage the player outside of their comfort zone and reward them for these activities. A narrative for change is integral to building the scaffolding that will support a player's new activities, extending the reach of the player, requiring them to work for, walk further or even jog faster in order to, retain, uh, to attain rewards. The key is that the narrative is seamlessly integrated with the gameplay and remains consistent with community mechanics. I don't believe this narrative needs to have an overt message around healthy living. In fact, I would, I would uh, warn against it. I think Zombies is a great uh, narrative, even though it's obviously not around um, healthy living. The, 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 to paraphrase, the mechanic is the message. If we're serious about making games for change, we need to reach out to our audience on their terms, and there is no point preaching to the choir. We need to create an ecosystem that is attractive to gamers and then reward them for healthy, healthy activities. Wrapping a narrative around a mechanic that will appeal to the target audience is far more important than delivering overt messages about healthy living. So the idea of getting off the train two stops early and walking home will seem ridiculous to a gamer, I was one of those gamers, if that means losing half an hour of gaming before dinner. But if that short walk immerses me, or them, in a gaming narrative and rewards them with DLCs or upgrades to in-game uh, items that they can use to beat enemies or share with friends, it suddenly has a new purpose. A short daily walk could be the small step that leads to healthier outcomes. Leveling up in the game is linked to increased activity in the real world. So once we've got them defining their own theatre, once we've got them enjoying their own activities and rewarding, for the, rewarding them, we can slowly leverage up over time. That's a classic game mechanic. So, initially we, get, we set out to get gamers outside. Now we have more specific goals. To create a game with an underlying mechanic that scales effortlessly, where location and social features integrate seamlessly, and where deep game mechanics and rich narrative are woven together. A game with a gentle on-ramp and a flexible architecture that fits players' lives and rewards increased activity. As you can probably tell, I'm a big fan of check-ins as a mechanic. The trick is building deeper narrative and gameplay into them. At Two Bulls, we've developed a location-based augmented reality engine, which is a hell of a mouthful, but very, very powerful and useful. Uh, it allows us to make check-ins more meaningful. 
It means that when you go to a specific location, you can enter a portal, tap on a, a, a little um, location-based uh, graphic, and it opens into a 3D environment which you, you can then explore. And that 3D environment is actually another player's game environment. So if they've built a tower, you can go in and explore the tower. In the example that we've built, we've built a game called Market Garden, which is releasing this month. Um, you can explore other people's gardens and you can find rewards in there. Um, it's, it's incredibly simple, but it's incredibly powerful, and it really gives a sense uh, of proper immersion. Um, the game also, and I don't want to talk too much about Market Garden because I know we're not supposed to be marketing here, but um, the game starts with players creating their, th their own theatre of play by establishing a garden at the location of their choice. Um, players can then, they grow produce, they follow a narrative with game mechanics that will be very recognisable to, to casual gamers, um, but they're also exp encouraged to expand their sphere of influence uh, by creating new gardens and interacting with other gardeners. Each gardener will hold daily events, and the bigger your sphere of influence, the more events you're invited to and the more rewards you get. You also get rewards for going to specific locations where you can pick up DLCs. Um, over time, we hope to increase the activity in these, uh, increase the intensity of these activities uh, so that you're rewarded in mini games, for instance, for jogging or for exercise. The fact that gamers in, can interact with each other, um, with, with each other's games through location based augmented reality check ins, means we've tied social and location based gameplay together into this unique immersive experience. And it's gone a long way to reaching our goals already. So, Thanks for listening to this. I just got the two minutes, so it looks like things have been okay. Um, we're really excited about the re release of Market Garden. Go and check it out at marketgardenhq.com if you want to know more about it. Um, and I look forward to coming back, uh, hopefully one day, to talk about all the things that went wrong with Market Garden and the things that we've learned from that. So thanks very much. Thanks, James. Questions? So is location-based games dead? No, not even close. I don't think we've really started. I mean, Foursquare was the only breakout hit that, that we've had. Um, but there are a lot of people experimenting. Check out Life is Magic, Life is Crime. Um, they're beautiful games. Um, I think it's um, what was said earlier about not relying on devices uh, is, is true, but I think also devices are evolving in this area. Um, and, but the most important thing is, is evolving game mechanics and um, educating people on what location-based games are. Um, and how much fun they can be. Mm. Question from you? That's, that was part of our original model with the Hidden Park, was to engage with parks um, and to really try and use people on the ground um, to, to sort of drive adoption. Um, we didn't find that was a particularly good model. Um, we, we've now shifted away towards really just trusting our users that if we get the on-ramp right, that they'll be able to build their own communities. Um, and I think that that's a much more, um, I mean, when it comes to online community engagement, that's a much more logical way of doing it rather than trying to fit it into existing groups. Yeah, yeah well, that comes back to that game mechanic I was saying where they, they get to set their own theatre of play. So we're, the way we market it is the same way everyone else markets casual games. And once you download the game, you, you can just set where you want to play. Um, and, other pe and, you can, and other people can do the same thing. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that was one of the restrictions that we had. Uh, it was the biggest thing to overcome, really. And, and if you talk to the guys from Red Robot Labs who did uh, Life is Magic, tie, I mean, I, I completely left out the commercial aspect of this, but tying those game mechanics and those social mechanics to a business model is incredibly difficult, and it means, frankly, that you have to make some co compromises. Um, if you want to see uncompromising location-based games, the Games for Play Festival in New York is the place for it, but uh, there, there's no way that y you can scale that. You know, uh, it's a hell of a lot of fun uh, for for two weeks, but it, it, there's no way you can scale it, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I was just thinking about um, what's your opinion on games that or or uh, platforms that allow you to build your own 
story or game like Scavenger or Aris and things we were talking about this during the break, yeah. um, versus something else um, like you described. But I was also heard about things like the Situationist, yeah. which oh, basically a lot, like is a great. The concept of it is great and actually encourages to interact with other people but kind of keep a secret. But ultimately, some of these things depend on the number of players that yeah. really make it enjoyable. And if there's no one playing, it's like you immediately just dies because. You play it once and go, oh, no one here. Yeah, about it. Massive chicken and egg problem there. And uh, I love Scavenger, by the way. I mean, I, I, when I first saw Scavenger, which was launched at the Games for Play Festival in New York, I thought, this is it. This is beautiful and it's brilliant. But you're relying... I mean, you, you, you illustrated it perfectly in, in the question. I mean, you're relying on this chicken and egg problem where if there's no gamers in there, it's no fun. And if there's no fun, there's not going to be any gamers in there. Um, and we have... We've dealt with that by... Um, by using a kind of dynamic model for our communities. So um, if you're in Ohio and there's no other gardens around you, then we will scale your community influence accordingly. If you're in, if you're in New York, then we'll decrease it. Okay. That's part of the solution. We've got a bunch of other solutions that, uh, that, that didn't make it into Market Garden. But, you know, it's a mixture of technical and game mechanic solutions. Really. Yeah. Can I, thanks. Can I suggest that you approach him uh, during the break or later on? Is that okay? Thanks. Right. Thank thanks you so much, much for coming.